Today I have the honor of interviewing the Honorable Paul Hellyer, who is a former Minister of Defense and Minister of Transportation of Canada. And I want to introduce three of his important books, including one that was published just last September of 2018. Uh, let me first share with you uh, the cover of the first book we're going to uh, discuss, and that is Hope Restored. So in Hope Restored, uh, this is the blurb that appears in Amazon for this book. This powerful book argues that the human species is at a tipping point when it is forced to choose between a new world order fascist government committed to rapid depopulation or a world of peace and justice. Hellyer demonstrates that God is alive, well, and everywhere, and that humanity's choice is between the dark and the light. To follow the light means giving up atomic weapons, replacing the oil economy with clean, zero-point energy developed by Americans in the 1960s, having governments create 34% of all new money for public purposes, rather than borrowing it from the 62 elite banking families, a reconciliation of the two main branches of Islam, and a just settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute to bring peace to the Middle East. Finally, it will be necessary for all countries, races, and faiths, especially young people, to forgive past atrocities and work together in common purpose to save the heritage they have in common. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hellyer, that certainly sums up a lot of the issues that I'm uh, very interested in, and I'd love to have you just comment on what your objectives are and how the, the word about this is getting out and how we should get it out, how, how you envision getting it out. Well, the, the first problem, as you know, is disclosure. Because the, uh, the alternate government of the United States and uh, other governments in cooperation with them have been keeping the truth from the people for about 70 years since uh, just after the Roswell crashes, mm -hmm. well, actually starting the, the day that the, uh, that the announcement was made, first of all, that uh, a disc had been found. Uh, it was announced by the uh, staff of the uh, commander of the local, uh, well, I guess at the time it was the Army Air Corps base. And uh, then later uh, his boss, uh, General Bring me. Um, had another press conference and uh, had a totally different story. He said, no, it wasn't a disc that was found. It was a Rowan balloon used for meteorological purposes. And that was the foundation, really, of deceiving the people. And in my, from my experience on just about every major issue that has arisen in the, in the intermediate years, and keeping them in the dark on things that have, uh, are of profound importance to the United States and to the world, to the point where you have a, a population which is really not in the loop and have no idea what's going on and somehow have to be made aware uh, of what has been happening these last uh, 70 years and do something about it before it's too late. And I have been proposing and then proposing uh, in my latest book that uh, a bipartisan uh, committee of the Congress uh, be set up and that the, uh, <clears throat> they uh, allow an amnesty from the National Security Act so that the people that are aware of these uh, things that have been happening can talk about them um, without, uh, without risking winding up in jail for the rest of their lives. And so uh, this is uh, one of the primary uh, uh, hopes and aspirations I have is to get somebody in the Congress that's sufficiently interested in uh, bipartisanship and, and forgetting uh, that uh, political parties are just political parties and they come and go, but that 
people issues, the future of the planet, and the future of the governance of the planet, and the future of our relationship with our extraterrestrial neighbors. These things are, are people issues which affect us all. And that these are the ones that we have to be concerning about, not uh, arguing over things that uh, will be of no consequence uh, you know, in a few months or years. So that's, uh, that's what keeps me, uh, I wouldn't say up at night because I sleep fairly well, <clears throat> but those are the things that keep me busy uh, on projects of one kind or another. And I just started a new one to uh, get out some five minute YouTubes on what I consider to be the, probably the 10 the most important issues facing humankind at the moment. And they're unabashedly promoting books mine and other people's because you don't get enough information from the popular press to have any idea of what's really happening in the world what has happened in the world and the only way you get it is from reading books and um, i often state uh, you know that um, this has been this has been known for a long while and uh, when uh, the uh, Alan Dulles allegedly was asked how he managed to uh, sneak so many Nazis into the United States. He said, it's because Americans don't read books. Canadians don't, Canadians don't read books either. I mean, the stuff's there. It's, right. A lot of it, but despite all the billions that have spent, been spent for secrecy, is available for anybody that wants to get a shovel and go start reading books. And so... That's kind of, uh, you know, operation one preliminary is to get a, a committee set up and get information out into the public domain. And if they do that, then government and the controlled press can't resist reporting it. And finally, the truth will be known. And if the truth is ever out, it's only the truth that will make us free. And that's the way we've got to go. So I do agree with you very definitely that the government is keeping a lot from us. We have in the United States, we have more than 750,000 people who have a top secret clearance in the United States. And so that's, you know, there are a lot of secrets. Oh, forever. So one of the topics that you raised about the elite banking families, I could give you an, an example from my own experience, which is that I, I dug and dug and dug until I found some secrets. Okay, the secret is that after the crash of 2008, the financial community got paid double on all defaulted mortgages, once by the U.S. government in the form of TARP, and once by people who had had failed mortgages because the economy collapsed, because they were going over the, what what they had done, what the financial community had done, and we haven't yet stopped them, is they had created a alternate currency, so that so that what they were doing was not appearing on the statistics that the Federal Reserve uses for determining inflation. And so what they did was they created a, an alternate currency in the form of um, mortgage-backed securities, which were not in the, in the stats, and then they inflated that currency very dramatically. And and there's no check or balance on that. So basically, um, the real estate records that are in every courthouse in the United States, and I presume in Canada too, are simply a facade. They, they don't mean anything because you can't go to that courthouse and actually find who, who owns your mortgage. It's, it's, that information is no longer kept there. But you it's a, have a pretty good idea. But uh, pardon? You and I have a pretty good idea who owns it. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. But the problem is that before 2008, and I suspect again now, the 
financial community is inflating that currency again and it inflated it before 2009 so this crazy time we had working up to September the 15th 2008 uh, was caused by the fact that the mortgage-backed securities are not actually backed by a real mortgage and what they did was they cut and pasted or or they made a duplicate copy of a mortgage and said this mortgage is supporting this mortgage-backed security and over on another one they're saying oh this mortgage backs this mortgage-backed security when in fact one of them is false entirely and so by doing that they created air they created a they created a, a false, um, well, they created inflation, basically, is what they did, which is why when, after 2008, when the Fed brought their interest rates down to zero, nothing happened, because the whole false economy that was off the books has to deflate, had to deflate uh, completely before anything new would happen. And I'm not sure it ever did fully deflate because now they've they've defanged the Dodd Frank bill, and so what I think is happening is that they're inflating it again, uh, but again off the books of the Fed, and so a, another crash will come soon. And I had a very interesting experience uh, in 2008 on that day. I happened to have been uh, involved in high-level real estate deals, and I was at a conference of people that fund huge buildings in Manhattan and every place, and the conference was out at uh, Half Moon Bay in California, and on that day, on September the 15th, 2008, which was the day that it was revealed that Lehman Brothers was bankrupt, I was standing in a group of these men, and one of them said to another, it was stupid of us to have a financial crisis in the middle of a presidential election. <laughs> and that was incredibly telling because it basically said, you know, they expect crashes, they know they're coming, they, they drive toward them, and, you know, so... Them. Pardon? They benefit from them. Right. And and so now I live in Annapolis, Maryland, next to a marina, and now we've had bigger and bigger boats in our marina, and none of them are being used. <laughs> but anyway, I, I've said a lot, so I, let me shut up and hear from you, sir, about the things that I've said. Well, I, I find it fascinating because, as you know, uh... The, the whole financial system is nothing but a deck of cards anyway. It's a giant uh, Ponzi scheme on which some people devised and sold to politicians with probably a little handshaking in the process. And, uh, and so you have trillions of dollars, which aren't really trillions of dollars. They're just bank deposits or mortgage uh, holdings. And uh, it's all a false system and they can crash it. The people that control it, can crash it when they want. They've done that, I think, I don't know, 30 times in the last 115 years or something like that. Right. Sessions or depressions. And um, the, the, the unfairness, I think, <clears throat> is that the system we have, A, gives the creators of money control. They have more power than anybody else in the world. Right. So, this is one of the PowerPoints that we have to address, and that's uh, I, I address in many of my books. Right. <laughs> yes. I, actually, let me bring up one of your other books because I think it's relevant, which is The Money Mafia. So this is one of the reasons I was interested in talking to you because of the unfairness I see in the crash of 2008 and the fact that the financial community got away with blaming the crash on single mothers of two in 
Memphis rather than himself. So I'm personally very troubled by that. And See, I go back to one, one generation earlier, the crash of 2930, which was deliberately uh, induced. By the right. Bank. And then your Senate committee, known as the core committee, um, when they finally looked at it, they tore the bank's pieces for their publicity, but nothing happens. That's the problem. And nothing right. happens in the right direction because the Congress, uh, just before Christmas, one year, more than a century ago, gave away the people's right to create their own currency. Right. And, and of course, and so they make it sound bad by saying it's fiat currency, which was currency that Abraham Lincoln created, among others, to uh, fund the Civil War. But you, you're talking about the government uh, creating 34% of new money uh, for government programs. And so I wonder if you'd talk about that for a minute. Sure, because for many years we have given these rich families um, monopoly to create money. But it's all created as debt. Right. It's manufactured out of thin air. There's nothing behind it, not even fiat money. It's not much anymore because there used to be, and I could go through the, when the, the uh, Bank of England was first, first uh, uh, incorporated and the king needed money for the finance of war. Uh, um, the rich people put in a million, 200,000 pounds for, um, for capital, spent it all king uh, at eight uh, percent, which is a pretty high interest rate for government guaranteed loan, and then to show his his uh, pleasure with them, he said, "You can print P R I N T another million two hundred thousand pounds and lend it to your friends." So in effect, the bank was lending to the government and to others, and collecting interest from both at the same time. When in the early years of the twentieth century in the U.S. Federally incorporated banks had to have a gold reserve of 25%. Right. They could lend the same money. <clears throat> well, then when I was young in Canada, our banks had to have a cash reserve of 8%, which meant they could lend the same uh, money 12 and a half times. When the, along comes Milton Friedman and his uh, particular uh, approach to things, the banks wind up being able to lend the same money. 20 times and in many cases more. So there's a, anybody that can manufacture money out of thin air and then lend it to 20 different governments, corporations, or people and collect interest from each one at the same time is going to become immensely rich. Sure. And that's our system and that's what's happened. And about six years ago, I think 88 families on half the wealth in the whole world, then it went down a couple of years later to, and finally wound up in, uh, in 2016 as 62 families, which you could put on a suburban street, or 50% of all of the wealth in the world. I can't get my head about that. I really, it boggles my mind. So I start counting the, the big cities, you know, on the Peking, Beijing, Hong Kong coming across. Uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Vancouver, and then in the middle, uh, New York and uh, Toronto and uh, Montreal and Manchester and, and uh, oh, I skipped uh, uh, oh, um, now Mexico City, huge, mm -hmm. and then across the, and and London, and Bonn, and all these right around the whole world. Every second one equivalent is owned lock, stock, and borrow by 62 people. Right. People are starving in the world, and some people don't have shirts on their backs. Some people don't have enough to uh, education to even find out what uh, they're capable of doing. All of these other things, and 62 families. There's an interesting uh, defense connection with this too, I, I should mention. Uh, I had a midshipman who I sponsored who became a F-18 pilot, so he was out on aircraft carriers, and at one point uh, he says, well, Skip, you know, it's horrible with China because 
if we put all of our aircraft carriers outside of, or near China, or maybe you said five, it maybe you said five aircraft carriers near China, we could only put 600 airplanes up in the air, and they have 3,000 that they can put out against us. And I said, well, don't worry about that because we owe the Chinese $2 trillion at that time. We owe the Chinese $2 trillion, and do you think we're going to pay that back if they start a war with us? <laughs> what was the answer? He, he didn't answer, but... He didn't he, answer, really. <laughs> I can understand. Okay, so we understand that that's a big issue. Let's move on to... We started to talk a little bit about Dr. Young and what I believe that God... that. Jung found the living God, where he lives, and how he goes about doing the business of the Godhead. But I wanted to hear what you say about it, because this says, so I haven't marked in red here, Hellier demonstrates that God is alive well and everywhere, and that humanity's choice is between the dark and the light. And so I wonder if you would comment on that. Sure. Um, actually, I have a very close relationship uh, with the Creator God, uh, which has been uh, developing over, uh, I guess, the last uh, 60 years or something like that. And uh, it's become so close that it's just like Father Son. Mm -hmm. and you, I, I ask uh, questions of all kind and get honest answers, and some of them are pretty mundane, and I'm almost embarrassed to ask them, but I still do. And uh, I get answers, and uh, and I know. Well, then, uh, then the um, the first the forces, and then the public got into remote viewing. Um, they, I guess it was uh, what's the name of the head of the Farsight Institute, uh, Doctor. Uh, he come to me, I'm sure. Um, found out one time when he was going into these things, that he found um, something very big. And he realized it, that it was God, and he, he was afraid to go there. But he managed to make a connection with Jesus, who said, go on and do it, which he did. And found out that God had created the universe from his own material from his own being mm -hmm. and uh, that it has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and that um, and that we are all connected the whole cosmos is connected which is the reason that some of our uh, extraterrestrial friends are so concerned about us putting off atomic bombs because it doesn't just affect uh, the little local community it affects all of our planet and beyond. And these things are, uh, are important to the whole scheme of things and we just have to stop doing it. I, I finally got up my, well, I, first of all, I said, you know, uh, Courtney Brown is his name. Courtney Brown says that you, you did this, you deliberately, in effect, blew yourself up and the um, and, and did you do that? And the answer was, uh, was something like that. And after a few weeks, I got the courage to say, well, the last time we were discussing this, uh, you said it was something like that. Is it, did you or didn't you? I said, no. And the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. So with the Big Bang, the cosmos was created, and all of the things that have happened and are happening began the way that we're seeing them and uh, and so all of the material matter matter all of the trees all of the rocks all of the water uh, all of the mountains all of the hills all of the oceans all of the people are part of gods and I, it was interesting because after I went public on this uh, matter of uh, extraterrestrials, at least the UFOs, uh, this was about 13 years ago, um, Edgar Mitchell, 
one of the Apollo astronauts was in Toronto, and he wanted to meet me, so he arranged it through a mutual friend. And we had an, uh, an interesting dinner at, uh, at our place, and uh, he started out by saying, uh, you know, talking about the alleged crash at uh, Roswell, and I said, oh, come on, it hurts. Not alleged. His face went all red because he knew that it wasn't. Uh, his very next words were, well, how many species do you think there are? And I said, I don't know, somewhere between two and 12. And he said, yes, that's what I think, too. And of course, we were both very conservative, as you would know, and uh, there are far, far more than that. And the US Army alone has a manual on how to handle, I think it's 54 or something like that. Right. But, but um, the interesting thing was, when I was talking about this other thing that we've just been talking about, I remember my wife was, was quite direct, and she said to him, do you believe in God? And he said, no, not if you mean an old man uh, there somewhere with a long beard. But he said, uh, I believe that the universe is his body. I'm sorry, the universe is what? God's body. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, interestingly, I just to mention, Michio Kaku, who's a famous TV cosmologist and um, uh, physicist, um, made the comment that every atom in the universe is, is attached to every other atom in the universe. And of course, physicists couldn't, uh, couldn't change that argument. That's obviously true. And so it's it's just very interesting to see how cosmology and physics are um, are converging. And one of the things that fascinated me was that uh, Carl Sagan and one of his students, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, have been adamant that many things don't exist in the universe. But then when they start to describe dark energy and dark matter, uh, they can't explain it without explaining it in terms that are very similar to psychological terms or mystical terms. That's a very fascinating fact. I, I happen to have your other book here, so let me just mention that because that's the one that has uh, Edgar Mitchell's comment. Uh, that's light at the end of the tunnel. You can read Mitchell's comment, but I'd like to talk uh, about the progression oh. of the trilogy. Maybe okay, so let me share my screen here. And so I'll just scroll it past so people can read it from the, from the interview here. Then at the end of this blurb is Ed, Edgar Mitchell's comment. And... It is, Paul Hellyer's story is an important contribution to the literature of modern Western civilization. His experience in government, his interest in exopolitics, and the issues of sustainability of civilization are significant areas of current discourse. At the time that you did light at the end of the tunnel, you were also thinking about uh, climate con consequences and uh, the Copenhagen Conference. And so I wonder if you would speak to us about that for a moment. Right, I'd like to come back to the climate in a minute, but just on the progression of the three books. First of all, I'd forgotten about uh, um, Edgar's uh, quote until I was writing my latest book. Mm -hmm. and there I was some good in support of other evidence that I was presenting. God name. Uh, Paul, could you sit a little closer to your microphone? Uh, is that better? Yeah. Thank you. I had forgotten uh, about his quote, but I had put it in my diary. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I looked for it, uh, uh, I found it in support of the other things that I had said. The, when I wrote Light at the End of the Tunnel, A Survival Plan for the Human Species, I thought that was all I was ever going to have to say because it covered quite a wide waterfront and uh, got me into the extraterrestrial field and so on. And there's a good line in it. Um, I said, I didn't know 
how much I didn't know, because I didn't know how much there was to know. Well, that's as true today as it was when I wrote it eight or nine years ago. Right. Because it's just like a scroll uh, opening from both ends to infinity, things that there are to know. And I don't know anybody that knows everything. And I don't know, and I, I would doubt that anybody knows anything except the Creator God who created it, and uh, so uh, I <clears throat> that sort of got me in the out, and I thought that was fine. And during the next four years, I found out so much more information, particularly in the underground <laughs> cities and, uh, and the cooperation between the U.S. forces, uh, certain species, and uh, so on, and uh, listen to. Uh, uh, Phil Schneider talking about some of the things that he had found and uh, passed on. I said, I'm going to have to write another book. So <laughs> I, that's when I wrote The Money Mafia, which is, I guess, probably something of a of a uh, classic now, and sort of revealing what happened and how various things evolved after World War II and so on. Well, then that was for sure the last one. Well, then I I got these other recent revelations concerning creation and so on, and uh, it wasn't really enough material for another book, so I um, thought about it, and I said, well, I don't want to put out a pamphlet uh, with uh, four or five chapters, maybe 60 pages or something like that, you know. And I have a colleague, he sat on the other side of the house from me at the time, but we're good friends, and uh, he said, when and where are you going to write your memoirs? And I kept putting them off, and then finally it occurred to me, well, why don't I write very abbreviated memoirs, because to write in full would take a thousand pages, nobody read it. And uh, so um, I finally said, well, what I'll do is I'll write my memoirs and tack this information about the cosmos and my relationship with the, with the creator at the end, which is what I did. And that was where the final book, uh, Hope Restored, uh, came from and the reason it was written. And uh, so it, it was, it was a, an important part in the progression of the trilogy, but it was, it was never intended until very late on because the information that's most important in that book was not something that was in my uh, vocabulary until, uh, until very recently. So uh, it has an important role to play, though, because it it makes this suggestion that I was talking about of trying to get out the truth and getting the uh, bilateral approach to these uh, very serious issues, including global warming, which I wanted to come back to, uh, into the public domain in a way that hasn't been possible so far. So um, I, I think it can make a contribution in that respect, because as far as global warming is concerned, I'm particularly uh, acutely, acutely aware of it at the moment because uh, three or four Canadian provinces are flooding, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, writers have told us, Dr. James Hansen in particular, it is, um, it is going to get worse. The typhoons are going to get worse, the, the storms are going to get worse, the rain's going to hit uh, harder when it does, and it's going to really create havoc with our, with our home. So I am saying that as far as I'm concerned, um, our world is on fire. I think the, the uh, weekly New York Times actually had a picture of the earth burning a few weeks ago, reviewing a book. I said, if we continue with the production of coal and oil, um, people will die, thousands of them. I don't know how many, because this is the future and none of us knows it precisely. But if we continue in that road, thousands of people are going to die. And it's going to, sometimes it will affect one of us. One of our loved ones could be, because it's, a, it's no respecter of persons, but so it's Right. and hit anywhere, anytime, and you never know until it happens. 
then it's too late to say, oh, I wish I'd been standing on the top of the mountain so I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, which which reminds me of something. I suppose you might be well aware of this, but for consciousness purposes, the the type of problem that we're talking about about how we make and use energy uh, is very significant. Because, and I'll give you an example, and it's where far more than a few thousand can die. In the Himalayas, the Chinese have built 17 dams that dam up the Ganges River. And if they were to do the wrong thing with those dams, it would affect 250 million people in India. And, and so we could we could easily envision that and you know, I know that Bangladesh which has a large portion of the the mouth of the Ganges is halfway under water when they have a big storm like the one they had a couple of weeks ago already and I've been there when there's been a storm and you literally have water up to your necks. <laughs> I mean, and so you talk about the fascist governments depopulating the world. That's a perfect example of where that can be ha can happen. And I had a, a direct experience in Bangladesh once where a friend of mine took me out in a little motorboat and we came upon one of these ferries that very often capsize in Bangladesh. And he just drove the motorboat around this ferry and it was so full, the ferry was so full that the gunnel was literally only a couple of inches over the over the water and I could watch the people on the deck of this ferry up, up at the high levels and they were watching our motorboats, they're, they're on one side of the boat and then they're on the other side of the ferry watching us as we went around the the ferry and I said, Oh my God, please get us out of here. I don't want to be responsible for a couple hundred people dying in a ferry capsize. But that that's the way they do it all the time. And, right. So anyway, I'm that's sorry. A good example, but there are many and uh, and we live precariously. And we don't need to take so many risks. But we are, and we've got to stop it. I think nuclear weapons is an interesting uh, topic because what people don't realize, but science, science has realized, that only the detonation of a very small number of nuclear weapons would uh, kill everything on Earth. Uh, I think I heard the number was 23, but uh, someone corrected me that there's a the number is more like a hundred, but of course we have 10,000 nuclear weapons in the arsenal. So what could possibly go wrong, right? But fortunately, normally in government, we have people that have developed up and developed more and more consciousness who control these things. But right now we have a very dangerous situation with a president who, before he took office, was saying, well, why don't we just use nuclear weapons on these things? And of course, he had no experience with national defense. He actually avoided service, so he had no experience. And so obviously, he wasn't connected with these facts. I'm sure now people in his government have corrected his information or his level of consciousness. But we're entirely dependent upon people in Russia and in the United States and China and other nuclear countries uh, keeping their cool and, and being mature enough and uh, with enough consciousness to understand what the issues are about using these weapons. I mean, you know, you find out I have a weapon now, I wish I didn't have it. I wish I didn't have to know about this. So how we get that down, that's a problem. Because, uh, 
you know, nobody is going to go out and unilaterally say, okay, I'm going to give up my nuclear weapons. Nobody would do that. But somehow we need to slowly step down the risk that's presented there. You know, and if we don't, there's going to be huge tragedy there some, somewhere or sometime. All it takes is one hot-tempered person for you know, a minute or two before they have time to think properly. And there was a rumor recently that the, uh, the United States was thinking of giving uh, nuclear knowledge to the uh, Saudis. Oh, my goodness, yes. And I, when I saw that, I felt heaven forbid, because that's the fastest road to a nuclear Armageddon in the Middle East. And it could easily spread from there right around the world. So right. We, there, there are these risks that we just have to try and avoid by one means or another, and as you suggest, uh, we, we want some uh, some common sense at uh, all levels and uh, and internationally and start uh, getting rid of some of the risk and spending our efforts and energies on global warming. And that's the right. immediate one. <clears throat> and um, I have um, been promoting a five-year um, program. I remember well in World War II, we converted all of the automobile plants and the, uh, the refrigerator plants and the uh, washing machine plants and the armaments plants. Yeah. And it worked in the circumstance. All we have to do is just the opposite. We have to take all of those armaments plants and convert them into zero point energy plants from manufacturing zero point energy engines put in every car, truck, tractor, uh, airplane, and house in the world as fast as we can do it. Right. If we did, if we did that, we'd save millions of lives and trillions of dollars, and less damage. But right. there doesn't seem to be the will to face the, uh, the fact that our house is on fire and that uh, your house is on fire, you don't say, well, let's have tea and uh, we'll discuss the, uh, the question and uh, see if what we should do about yeah. it. I wonder if you'd um, comment a few mo for a few moments here on this phrase that one of the things that's needed is a reconciliation of the two main branches of Islam. And I wonder if you'd give me a, a little bit more of an idea of what you have in mind there. What I have in mind is you can't solve, resolve problems unless people talk. Unless, I'm sorry. With, unless people talk right. face to face, break bread, bread together. Right. That's the way to solve problems. Because you can't kill somebody you know really well, because you find out they're just human like yourself. And their kids are as human as your kids. And, uh, and it's, it's too bad. Uh, that we have this rift between the Sunnis and the Shias, because look at what's been happening in Yemen, what's been happening in Syria, and it's it's criminal. Uh, the the resources, you know, the, the, the results. With the church I attend, we've uh, we brought a couple of families over. Uh, and my wife and I uh, uh, took in as a border uh, a refugee from uh, from Iraq who was uh, in danger of having his life taken because he's a filmmaker and he made a film a little bit critical of the uh, regime there and uh, and so on. But the, the, the world is just a big powder, powder keg. And so I think, and it should, probably should be under the auspices of the, uh, of the UN, that you have to get those two main branches together because they have the same holy book. And this, their holy book says you cannot kill unless it's just. And that means you can't go and blow yourself up and kill a lot of innocent people any more than you can use a drone to go in and try and knock off one person and go uh, in the process. So we have to, all the holy books, they the same thing. And the one thing in common of all the major religions is to do unto others as you would wish that they would do unto you, but none of us practice it. That's the real problem. Yeah, that's the problem, and that's why we have to get a better 
control of our psyches and understand our psyches. So one of the things that you said here in or that's in this blurb of Hope Restored, which I think is really important, I'll put it back up on the screen for a moment, is finally it will be necessary for all countries, races, and faiths, especially young people, to forgive past atrocities and work together in common purpose to save the heritage that we have in common. And um, do you want to comment on that? I have some observations, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to well, steal the, your thunder. <laughs> the, the problem is you've got to stop the tit for tat or the eye for an eye or especially the eye, of, uh, take your whole body for an eye or whatever, which has been going on in the world recently. And, uh, and you have to say, look, um, sorry, the atrocities that we have uh, been guilty of or our ancestors have been guilty on of in the past are past. And we've got to stop saying we're going to get even because you never get even. There's if no you, even, right. There's no even. And if you create a new cycle, it just keeps going on and on and on and nothing ever happens. I've seen a lot of, talk to a lot of people who, we're still fighting battles that are 500 years old or a thousand years old. And this is not what we have to do. We have to say, okay, come up and wipe the, the uh, blackboard clean and take off all that stuff and just say, we forgive each other because it's <clears throat> worked both ways. In my first book there, The Light at the End of the Tunnel, I talk about the religious rivalry and the, the damage that it's done and, uh, and nobody's exempt. There are no absolutely pure strains anywhere and uh, and say enough is enough and what we have to concentrate on is saving our planet and then make it a just planet because even the way back in the old testament that uh, i was talking about justice there's a spot in micah there where he says that that's what he wants he doesn't want the sacrifices of, of cattle and uh, and other things. He wants people to walk humbly. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a tough one. Sure. <laughs> people to walk humbly with the Lord and to pursue a world of justice. Right. What that, we, yeah, go ahead. I, well, that's, that's really what we have to set as a goal. Right. And, and one of the things that Dr. Young did throughout his 60 years of writing was that he found that he found he showed the the similarities in every, between all the religions not only Christianity and Islam and Judaism which all are Abrahamic religions but all religions Dr. Edward Edinger made the observation that he really penetrated to the source of all religions and if if we think of it that way and think of the fact that they all fundamentally do the same thing he he said that they all are evolutionary methods of psychotherapy that came along before anybody had thought about psychology or psychiatry and of course he was a psychiatrist but the idea would be instead of finding the differences between our religions why don't we turn around and find figure out how they're the same and how we're all trying to get to the same point which is what dr young's point was um, i beg your pardon the extent to which the goals are the same Exactly. I give the tongue-in-cheek comment, you know, the, the Muslims pray five, five times a day. What could be wrong with that? Let's all do that, because that can't hurt, right? <laughs> it can't hurt. <laughs> okay, so, so anyway, the, a point I wanted to make about this comment, though, was uh, the idea of forgiveness. And are, are you familiar with the work of Elias Canetti? who was a Nobel Prize winner in literature. Oh, I regret to say it. 
Okay, well, Elias Canetti wrote a book called Crowds and Power, and that book is the most frightening book I ever read. Um, but one of the things he, er, he observed about the way we handled uh, the post-war period after World War I and the post-war period after World War II is that after World War I, through the Treaty of Paris, uh, the Allies wanted to punish the Germans and therefore, and they did punish the Germans, they put them into a terrible inflationary spiral and a, and a horrible depression long before the Great Depression actually began and that caused huge resentment among the German populace and, and Hitler actually had a phrase which he said the, the diktat of uh, Versailles uh, and he would use that in his speeches as just a knife to go into the heart of the psyche of all Germans the diktat of D Versailles the diktat of Versailles as being unfair and un inappropriate but after World War II instead we did the Marshall Plan where we rebuilt both Germany and uh, Japan and the result is that they became among our strongest allies and among the strongest countries in the world and they really both achieved much of what they had sought to achieve by uh, warfare before and I wonder if you have any comment about that. No, I think uh, cooperation is the way to go. There are, you know, there are many uh, aspects of these things but uh, certainly reconciliation forgiveness. They're the only way to go. And then I say, what is it we want to accomplish? <clears throat> Do we want to have a world where all our little children uh, have uh, a shirt on their back and uh, water to drink and a little food to eat and a uh, roof over their head um, and a little basic education so they can find out what their potential is? Or do we want to have a world where 62 people have half the wealth and, uh, and a lot of little Children are starving and emaciated and, uh, and no hope of getting anywhere because they have no education to develop um, their potentials. And it's really what I prefer the first is what I call building the, the, the kingdom of God on earth. Right. That's the, the object as far as I'm concerned is to build the kingdom of God on earth and uh, try and do it his way because we, we've been, a lot of us have been uh, sort of going the way of his errant son, Lucifer, for quite a while now. We call him by various names, but uh, the Bible is referred to as the evil one. And uh, we've been taking our cues from uh, from him and uh, living according to the uh, things he's been putting in our heads in the morning instead of uh, the nice things that could be there. So we just have to, that's what I call the dark. And we just have to say, uh, no, we're going to shut that, uh, that, uh, wavelength off and uh, pray about it and even pray for the people that are going that way because a lot of them never really thought about it and then turn the, in the other direction and try and listen to uh, the, uh, the wavelengths that are light pure light and move in that direction and build the kingdom of God on earth and if so our species will survive even if we have something of a rocky ride for decades until we get this uh, global warming cleaned up. Right. There's, a, there's an interesting dichotomy between Freudian psychology and Jungian psychology. Freud wanted to, through the talking cure, go back and get all your resentment up. So he wanted to spend all this therapeutic time of the talking cure talking about what happened to you. Jung said, let's plant a flag where we are now, each and every one of us. Each of us is the center of our universe. And let's be conscious of what's happened in the past, uh, that bad things have happened. Bad things have happened. But our life, no matter how old we are, is a life that begins today, right now. And the question is, what will we do today 
to make our life better and make our relationships better and um, and what should we avoid doing because as Jesus said we have to test the spirits and that was in 1st John 4 1 uh, where he he said that we have to test the spirits because good ideas and bad ideas come up and right. and if we don't reconcile then we're going to get the opposite of reconciliation that's basically what the lesson of the post world war 1 and post world war 2 story is i think absolutely true that we have to change our ways and forgive you never forget you don't have to forget right you can't forget. But you have to forgive, and as you say, <clears throat> the past is history, and we start from today. The future may be a mystery, but today is a blessing, and let's uh, use it uh, to go in the right direction rather than the wrong one. Right, and Dr. Young pointed out that uh, a neurosis is where one part of us wants to do one thing, and one part wants to do the other thing, and we have that neurosis in the United States right now between our red states and our blue states and his point was that you can't you can never cure a neurosis okay you can't it never happens and so what you need to do is draw, draw a circle around it and then pu push it off in another part of our psyche and then figure out what you're going to do to move on and to mature out of it basically is what he's saying which is another way of saying uh, to reach a new level of consciousness where we can as a species mature out of our various neuroses it, it's been really interesting speaking with you sir i, I don't know it, are there other things that you would like to talk about or we covered uh, the waterfront fairly well for this morning thank you and uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you and uh, talk with you and uh, God bless you and carry on nobly. Uh, thank you sir and and thank you Miles very much for organizing this interview. I appreciate it very much. Mr. Hellyer thank you so much for doing this. It's a true honor and I will be editing this within the next few days and put it online and when I do I'll let you know what the link is so that you can view very it. Nice. So, so thank you again Miles. I, uh, Mr. Hellier, uh, so nice to be able to eavesdrop in on this. And what I would like to encourage the two of you to, would be to jointly publish this, transcribe this conversation, as well as have it in the video form. Do you think that would be possible? I, I think you could do it, Miles. I, I think uh, Mr. Hellier and I may, okay. may be up I will, to our ears and things to do. I will type it up. Very good. You're, you're welcome to do it, and we'll find a way to publish it. I do Excellent. have a website. I'll work on that. I have Great. a website where we can publish it, so uh, please do. You might want to wait until you get the edited version Very of, good. of the interview. Yeah, and then I'll include your, auto, your biographies. Right. So, uh, Mr. Hellyer, is there anything that we've said in this interview that you would prefer to have edited out? I don't think so. You, I'll leave that to you. But uh, I, I, I don't have secrets. And uh, I have only one line. <laughs> I try to stick to the same line. Sometimes I change it when I get more knowledge. Right. Um, uh, but... Uh, I'm, I'm working toward the kingdom of God on earth and uh, trying to serve, uh, serve him dash her because I'm, I don't think there's a distinction there and uh, I do the best I can uh, to live the kind of life and talk about it that uh, I think he would want. I, I think that's a terrific sentiment. Anyway, Miles, if you're still there, the reason I believe in miracles and the only reason I get out of bed in the morning is because I've seen them happen in my own life. So I know they exist. And I know that uh, people of other dimensions can walk through doors and walk on water and do all of the things that uh, people thought were, uh, were either wrong or uh, magic. And uh, someday we'll be able to do them too. Right. Dr. Dr. Young had a amusing story. It was a rabbinical story 
where a student asked the rabbi, uh, why don't men see God anymore as they did in ancient times? And the rabbi responds that we're too inflated and my God comes in under the door. <laughs> <laughs> or or through the electrons of the right. of YouTube and the internet. All right. Well, I guess we better sign off, and I better get to work. All right, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's all. It's been a real pleasure. Nice to yeah. meet you. I enjoyed it very much. Bye bye.